than the more commercial conifer stands. So they might be more representative of the kind of open woodland that black grouse favour. And secondly, when these woodlands are created on open moorland, they're fenced off to exclude grazers. And we think that this might lead to some recovery of the field layer vegetation, which we also know is important for black grouse during the breeding season. So for the study, we used LEC data from this, uh, the Tayside population collected by a, uh, a very active local volunteer group. And uh, black grouse are a lecking species. So the, um, counting the number of males which are attending LECs is generally the most efficient way to generate indices of annual abundance. And it's a 700 square kilometer study area, so that gives us a really good insight into how uh, large-scale habitat change can affect this species. And so we, we mapped the, the spatial configuration of a range of different habitat types, in particular separating, separating out different uh, categories of woodland within the study area. And we also calculated a range of uh, typical topographical variables, such as altitude and gradient. And as well as mapping the large-scale uh, configuration of habitat, we also collected some detailed measurements of vegetation structure and composition from within these new native woodland plots and also on the adjacent unplanted moorland, which would allow us to compare the relative quality of the resources uh, in these two habitats. And for the, for the analyses, we looked at correlates of three measures of our black grouse data. So firstly, uh, where the leks were located within the study area. Secondly, what was associated with the size of each lek. And then thirdly, the key test, which was what, uh, fa what variables were associated with change in lek size over time. And we looked at these for within three distance bands surrounding leks, which were 500, 1500, and 3000 meters. And these relate to various uh, aspects of grouse breeding biology. Okay, so on to the results. And so first, so these are the results of multivariate analyses. So there's, for some of these tests, there's a range of uh, explanatory variables that were significant. However, for today, I'm just going to uh, focus on those results which relate to new native woodland. But uh, if there's time afterwards, I'm happy to discuss any of the other results. So firstly, in terms of lek location, we found that leks were more likely, leks were more likely to be located where there was a greater amount of new native woodland edge habitat within this 1,500 metre radius of leks. And this applied both to all leks within the study area and also just a subset of those which we knew had been newly created within the most recent years of the increase phase. And then secondly, we found that leks were larger where there was a greater area of this new native woodland also within a 1,500 metre radius. And then the, the key test of uh, changes in lek size over time. So the only variable that was a significant correlate of this was the amount of new native woodland cover within a 1500 meter radius. And this was a quadratic relationship with growth in lek size peaking at around 30% land cover uh, within this distance band. And this is equivalent to uh, roughly just over two square kilometers of native uh, surrounding a lek. Okay. Um, okay. So this was, yeah, the only variable associated with population increase. But we, we were then interested in whether the age of the new native woodland showed any association with change in lek size. So we calculated mean age surrounding each lek and found a really interesting result that the growth in lek size was greatest where the native woodland was young, so averaging about five years since establishment. And the, so the, uh, the horizontal line on the right-hand graph is, is zero growth in uh, lek over time. So anything above that is an increase in lek size, and anything below it is uh, a, a decline in leks. And so we found that after about, when the native woodland was about 20 years of age, uh, leks declined in size. And this is obviously uh, quite similar to the results that have been previously found for commercial conifer woodland. <coughs> 
So there's evidence of benefits of these native woodland plots for black grouse. Uh, but to try and explain why these benefits occur, we looked at our detailed data on vegetation structure in, uh, in the woodland and adjacent moorland and found that within, within these native woodland plots, the field layer vegetation was taller and denser than moorland. And also there was greater cover of plants such as heather and blaeberry. And we know that these are important uh, during the breeding season for black grouse. So some evidence of the kind of resources that these native woodland plots offer. But clearly we've got this result with the declining benefits of woodland with increasing age. So we looked at whether the field layer measurements within our plot showed any changes with age but actually these relationships were quite weak and as I said we might expect this uh, flush of regrowth following fencing of the plots however once greys have been excluded for any length of time you might expect the field layer vegetation to become quite rank if there's no grazing to stimulate new growth however we found only weak evidence for this so maybe there's other mechanisms which lead to these declining benefits of native woodland for example canopy closure However, as I said earlier, because these plots are planted at lower densities than commercial stands, we would expect effects from canopy closure to be weaker. There might be other effects such as uh, increased predation risk, and we know that upland landscapes containing commercial conifer woodland can uh, support higher predator abundancies than more, op than more open landscapes without woodland. But we currently don't have any data as to whether native woodland supports these increased predator populations and I think this would be something important uh, to look at in future research. So just to summarise, we found that new native woodland was associated with increase in lek size peaking at around 30% cover. So whilst this was the, the habitat that was associated with increase, clearly if you want to manage these upland landscapes of black grouse, you'll need to include other habitats. For example, retaining sufficient areas of open ground, because we know moorland is also an important habitat for black grouse. Uh, secondly, the, the benefits of these woodland plots were greatest in young woodland, averaging about five years old. So if you want to maintain the benefits of these native woodland plots over time, they're probably going to have to be subject to some kind of periodic management, for example, through grazing. And then, so finally, uh, why, are these, why are these results important? Well, the, the wider context to this is that the uh, UK and devolved governments have a range of policies to increase woodland cover. For example, in Scotland, there's an aspiration to increase cover from 17 to 25% of land area by 2050. And clearly, we would, we would predict that this could be beneficial for woodland biodiversity, but it might negatively impact on for example, moorland biodiversity, because we think a lot of this new woodland is going to be created on open moorland. And obviously, we only looked at black grouse in this study. There's a lot more work to do to look at the, the wider ecological impacts of woodland expansion. And finally, as I mentioned, I think uh, looking further at whether native woodland induces the same kind of edge effects that, in terms of predation risk that commercial conifer forestry is associated with would also be useful. Okay, thanks for listening. Okay, does anyone have any questions for David? Okay, and can we get some microphone over? Thank you. Hello? Yeah, it's on. Sorry. Great. Sorry about that. Um, can I just ask, uh, do you think that um, this research has any read across to elsewhere in the black grouse, in the British black grouse range where Scots pine isn't native? Yeah, I think the results should be more widely applicable. So there's anecdotal evidence of increases in black grouse further north in Scotland, in, in the North Highlands. But that we haven't really examined yet whether those increases are also associated with native woodland. There is a, a national survey planned for 2017, so hopefully the results of that might allow us to look a bit more widely at uh, changes in relation to habitat. Okay, any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I have a question. Your, um, your graph where you had all those points beautifully lined up, were yeah. they predictive points or were they actual 
Yeah, it's, it, that was the fitted curve. Okay. So it was just to show the spread of data uh, along the x-axis. I, mean, I could have plotted it without the points. Okay. Okay. Yep. Sorry, it's just a general one. It's a really good talk because I know nothing about grouse or the um, problems facing changes in Scotland. But where you count the males, is there any general ratio that you know of, the females to males in that area, or is it just all over the place depending on habitat? Uh, I mean, trying to count females is, is quite difficult. I mean, they will, they will attend the leks, particularly to, you know, during the, sort of the mating stage, but they're... They're far less variable in their attendance compared to the males who are, you know, all there to display. So it's much harder to to measure female abundance. Okay, we've got time for one more quick question. If there are And our next speaker is Jez Smith from Cardiff University, who's going to talk us to us about productivity and population decline in pied flycatchers. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I would first like to start with uh, thanking my funders and um, data providers. So Cardiff and NERC are funding me, and it's with permission from the BTO and the RSPB uh, that I'm pro uh, providing this data, uh, with a specific look towards uh, South Wales. So my study species is the enigmatic pied flycatcher. It's a very well studied long distance migrant, uh, breeds in Wales, migrates through Portugal, uh, and then down and winters over in uh, West Africa. It's so well studied due to its propensity to nest in uh, nest boxes. And obviously it's a whole nester naturally, um, but it actually preferentially chooses nest boxes. Because of this, it's been, um, people have been able to study them for a while now and become, um, they're able to provide very detailed information on their abundance. So this is a graph from uh, the British Trust for Ornithology over the last sort of 20 years, showing a very steep and um, significant decline, so much so that it was recently put on the uh, red list of threatened species in the UK. <coughs> so, Although it's uh, nationally declining, we're, sp we're focusing on a very specific area uh, down in South Wales called Cumclidach, which is an RSPB managed reserve, um, and it's shown here. The area of the total woodland is about 3.3 kilometres uh, squared, but the two areas that I've highlighted uh, with the ovals are the grazed areas, and this is something that I'm going to be focusing on uh, particularly. So the grazed areas um, are then compared with everything else, because there are nest boxes throughout the entire woodland. It's a traditional uh, kind of Welsh woodland, steep-sided, uh, predominantly predominant with oak, uh, which is absolutely ideal for pied flycatchers. So the work started in 1986, hence 30 years of data, um, and now, uh, and then the, uh, the number of boxes was consistent from about 1990 onwards. So the aims of the talk is to try and quantify this decline in pied flies, particularly in the Cumclidach Reserve, um, and see how that compares with the uh, national average. And also then um, identify the trends between the grazed and the ungrazed areas to see if land management is having, uh, having a significant effect. We'll also look at the demographics, so sort of clutch size, uh, breeding productivity, um, and those, and see how they actually then feed into, uh, they actually then feed into uh, population change. And finally, the aim of the project um, is to determine the link between climatic variables uh, and productivity and identify whether these are direct or indirect effects, uh, potentially through uh, food-mediated effects. So, uh, on the left you have the Cumclidach data, which very similarly uh, mirrors that of the national average as well. But what's of particular interest is the fact that this, um, the numbers of pied flies on the, on the y-axis compared with the year um, changes its, its trajectory when uh, grazing finished. So we, we try to identify whether grazing is having an effect. So how I'm going to go through the talk is looking at the global decline and how that's matched in South Wales. Look at the grazing management and seeing uh, the rates of decline if they're similar between the two. Then 
we've got the fact that uh, grazing is preferred. <clears throat> but does, it, does that mean that there's better fledging <clears throat> excuse me, um, in the grazed areas? How the uh, variation in that productivity um, is, related, is related to climate? And then is that directly or indirectly affected? And therefore, what's the effect of food? So, to graze or not to graze? That is the question. So pied flies preferentially choose nest boxes uh, in grazed areas. So here on the y-axis we have uh, the proportion of boxes which are occupied um, with, the gray, um, with the green being grazed areas and the blue being the ungrazed areas. So we can see the trend is the same in both of the areas um, with normally the grazed areas being sort of preferentially chosen over the ungrazed areas. The difference in error bars is due to the, there are many more boxes in the ungrazed areas than the grazed. So there's no change in the rate of decline, but what about the productivity? Are the birds actually producing better chicks? Nope. Uh, so there's still no um, significant difference in productivity between the grazing regimes, and there's lots of interannual variation. So if the chicks aren't actually any sort of better off, i.e. they're not producing more chicks per egg, then why are they actually choosing the grazed areas? So is it something else that's not productivity? Um, and it's not, the it's not the clutch size either, so the number of eggs that are laid. So again, there's no statistical difference um, in the clutch size and the Y compared with, um, or over time, compared with the ungrazed areas. And also there's, an, uh, there's no significant difference between um, the fledging, so the number of chicks uh, that actually leave the nest <laughs> between the grazed and ungrazed areas on a, um, on a long-term scale, but there is then between year. So there's something going on um, that's happening between years. So, so far, we know that pied flies are declining, both nationally and locally. We know that they are preferring grazed areas, but actually so far, with the metrics shown, it's not actually any better for them. So there's no difference in clutch size and there's no difference in long-term fledging success, but we're still finding a between-year variation. So uh, we then looked into what could be causing this. And one of the uh, metrics we've looked at uh, climate-wise is temperature, although rainfall uh, and other variables have been, have been looked at as well. So there's no significant effect uh, in April, but there is a very significant difference um, in May. So with an increase in temperature, you decrease the productivity by about 4% per degree um, increase. Conversely, you've then got the opposite effect in June. So actually an increase in temperature um, increases breeding productivity. So it's potentially through um, incubation pressures being lifted. Or it could be about food availability. So what we can actually do to try and understand whether this is a direct or indirect effect by climate is to have a look at the quality of the chicks. So the same number may be being um, fledged, but actually are those chicks of higher quality? Do they have better post-fledging survival, for example, which could then uh, lead into overwintering survival and the probability of coming back? So this is all sort of the next stages uh, of the project. And one way to actually test this experimentally uh, is with feeding experiments. So we could potentially artificially extend um, the width of the time in which food is available, or we could change the phenology, uh, change the timing of when the food is available. So this graph is actually from sort of another data set, but it shows the uh, FRAS, which is caterpillar poo abundance, which is a proxy for uh, caterpillar biomass um, on the y-axis, and then days through a single season uh, in two different woodlands. And the, uh, the red line is the oak woodland, which is in sort of mid-Wales, and has got a very healthy population of pied flycatchers. Um, and the blue line is a mixed deciduous woodland in lowland Wales, um, which, which doesn't. And we can see that the peak in uh, abundance of caterpillars, or frass, um, is quite well married with the uh, food resource ne uh, needed by the chicks in a given year. This is work that's going to be sort of ongoing through the next couple of years, and we'll uh, use the feeding experiments to sort of manipulate this 
So what we can do is we can then put this into a new statistical technique called integral projection models, where we take all of the various different aspects, the inputs, so the temperature, rainfall, and invert abundance, look at how they impact laying date, and then also see how the effect size of each of those then translates into um, the plasticity of laying date for the next year, the fecundity, so the number of chicks, uh, the fledge, and the survival of the chicks and of the adults as well all of which will then lead into, with a varying degree of uh, impact, into a population change. And so by going from the um, inputs right the way through to population change, we hope to be able to identify what might be causing the drivers and how this change might change over the, uh, the course of the next few years. So in conclusion, pie flies are still declining. Uh, they prefer grazed areas, but we don't know why, and we'll test this experimentally. Temperature does have a significant impact on fledging, whether this is positive or negative depends on the month and the degree of impact. What actually is the relationship, whether it's direct or indirect? And we will do this, we'll tease this apart using feeding experiments. So thank you very much, and thank you to the RSPB for allowing me to use all their data. study on prairie chickens in the States where they seem to be preferentially choosing, and I can't remember whether it was the, the grazed or the ungrazed habitat, and they also found no differences in productivity or anything like that. Mm. They're sort of suggesting it might be a misperception of the cues in the environment, so they're actually, for some reason, they're not interpreting the environment properly. Perhaps there's been some change over evolutionary history that has led to them originally preferring grassland and now it doesn't seem to match that cue. I don't know if you've any thoughts on, on that, whether there's some sort of change in perception, perhaps. That's interesting. Um, my feeling is that, it, obviously, it could sort of be an ev evolutionary thing, um, but consistently, year on year, for them to keep going back. These are birds that only live you know, a short number of years. So over a 20, 30 year period, for it to consistently be the case, it's, there's got to be some benefit to them. It may not be anything that we're obviously directly looking at, um, but it may be some complete artifact of the fact it's grazing, much like in the planet Earth um, the other day with the, with the beaters and the elephants, it might be that it's easier for them to forage. For example, if the sheep are going through and the flies are being kicked up, it might be easier for them to catch them. Um, it might be that um, it's kind of it's less preferred with other species, and therefore uh, there's less competition. So there may be other kind of metrics that the adults may be in a better condition, but actually that doesn't necessarily um, translate to kind of productivity, especially when productivity does tend to be quite high anyway. So in a good woodland, for example, whether it's grazed or ungrazed, there does tend to be a very good sort of rate of productivity uh, in the first place. Yeah, so it looks like on. So it looks like the vast majority of the decline occurred in a relatively short period, so over about ten years. Mm. And have you looked at the role of any changes in the wintering grounds that could have driven that? So it's been um, reasonably well studied in the yeah the Sahel rainfall is is a particular sort of driver that's that's known. Um, and that does, have, that does have a bearing, but we're also seeing that um, the, yeah, there's still this kind of variation between year with how many are, com are coming back. And there is a direct relationship between the productivity of, of one year and then the numbers coming back the next year on the breeding ground. Um, so yes, the Sahal sort of rainfall definitely sort of does have, does have a significant impact. Um, but it doesn't seem to be sort of explaining everything. Thanks, that, that was very interesting. Um, the sites that we've got in the Peak District tend to have 
um, hairy wood ant nests, which are very productive, and our guests are quite important in the food chain for the flycatchers. And they appear to decline quite dramatically when we exclude grazing from the sites. And you get a, a drop in temperature at the ground with a reduction of grazing. But we also seem to lose the, the huge numbers of ants, which may well be available at a key point, point of the season. And I just wondered if you had wood ants in your woods. Um, so I think we do. Uh, but certainly not in any kind of number that would be um, productive enough. So from, from this year's data, um, I've been doing a lot of pitfall trapping as well. And with the sort of extensive set of uh, traps that we have through the woodland, uh, a tiny, tiny proportion of them were, uh, were ants. It was far more sort of beetle larva, uh, beetles and spiders. And it seems to be that spiders are uh, very important and beetles uh, at the beginning of the season. Uh, and then moving into caterpillars. Um, I haven't seen them um, sort of foraging on ants particularly here, although they do make up a major part of the diet uh, in West Africa. Yeah. So um, I must say I've got no experience of the, the wood ants in my st study sites, um, but that is an interesting idea that you, know, you might see these sort of the married declines um, in another woodland. I mean, it's just one of those things where we've, we've excluded grazing to regenerate the woodlands, mm. but an unexpected consequence, which I suppose was predictable was that we seem to lose some of the invertebrates, which are key for pie fly catcher, wood warbler, green woodpecker. Yeah, absolutely, as you say. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you change the, sort of the regime, there will be a, sort of a decrease in abundance of inverts overall. Um, so, yeah, as you say, it's probably sort of quite, quite expected, but at the same time, yes, it will impact different species yeah. sort of differently. But, okay, thanks. Yeah. Cheers. And our next speaker is right. Our next speaker is Matthew Geary. And if I can get this file open, it's thinking. So it's a dangerous process for a computer yeah. to go through. It's a PDF, is it? Yeah, it's a PDF. Um. So hopefully shortly, um, Matthew is going to be talking to us about hen harrier um, nest sites on the Isle of Mull and their habitat associations. Yeah, Hi, everyone. Um, I am from the Conservation Biology Research Group um, at the University of Chester, which is um, just over there, actually. Um, so this is almost like a home gig. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about hen harriers on mull. I'm going to talk to you about two things, really, two, two main take-home messages that I want to get across to you. Um, one of those is a methodological one, that point process models provide um, a really useful new way of dealing with some of the presence-only data that we end up with um, when we're monitoring species of conservation concern. And secondly, that hen harriers on mull, uh, and possibly some of the other Scottish islands, are um, a little bit more flexible in terms of their habitat than, than we might initially expect from what we often think about in terms of hen harriers based on their um, most pressing conservation concerns. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Alan Fielding and, and Paul Howarth, um, particularly Paul, who did a lot more walking about to get the data than um, I did, um, since I didn't do any at all. So, uh, much appreciation to Paul and any other volunteers who helped with that. The hen harrier is um, a medium-sized raptor. It's ground nesting and feeds on, on small birds and small mammals. I would explain loads and loads about hen harriers, but I think those are the main details that you need to know. Um, you do read a lot about them in the news every now and again, so you could probably pick up some other issues to do with their biology from that. Um, one thing that some of you might notice is that this hen harrier is not on the Isle of Mull. In fact, 
again, for a bit of local pride, this hen harrier is just over the other side of the Wirral um, on the D estuary. So a lot of the pictures of hen harriers in this talk, just to add a bit of local colour, um, particularly for the time of year, are actually just over there um, because we have good stuff here too. So the thing about hen harriers that, that most people um, are aware of is that hen harriers are associated with open moorland. Um, heather moorland, particularly um, in the UK, moorland that's managed for um, the shooting of red grouse. Um, and that is a pattern that we see all over the place. In fact, if we look at the distribution of hen harriers throughout the country, um, it's, it's exactly where you'd expect to think about that. It, it goes right up to the sort of uh, open moorland in the flow country, down through the Cairngorms, uh, through Scotland, right down uh, to potentially parts of, of Munster in the west of Ireland um, and um, Snowdonia. All the kind of upland moorland habitat. But when we look at the, the changes in breeding abundance, um, there are some patterns here that I, I think are important. One of these is that there are lots of areas on that distribution map that when this um, breeding atlas was um, put together where hen harrier populations were declining. But also, there are some populations which have red dots on this map that, that are um, increasing at this point. And they are on, on the um, Hebrides and the islands off the west of Scotland. And to me, that's interesting. Because when we look closer at those areas the habitat doesn't look like we might expect. These are two examples of hen harrier um, breeding habitat, one I think in Kintyre and the other one on, on Uist. The first thing that I think you'd notice about these habitat is they're not open heather moorland, either of them, um, and they've both got trees. So there has always been um, evidence that hen harriers are using forested areas, um, that, that they're using them... Um, whether for, for foraging or using them as part of their um, habitat area, part of their territorial area. Um, evidence for, from Ireland shows them using even second rotation plantation uh, forestry um, for hunting. And we find similar kind of things when we, we look closely at places like Mull. These are two um, parts of breeding habitat on Mull that have very different uh, habitat in some ways, but the thing about them is that they both, deviate, uh, they both deviate from this kind of classic open landscape that we might expect. One is an area being allowed to naturally regenerate, which has um, a lot of scrubby habitat, some quite dense vegetation. And the other um, is in amongst uh, managed forestry plantations, where we have trees of all sorts of different rotations in there, including um, clear cuts and, and um, areas that have been restocked and that sort of thing. This is interesting because of the context that, um, those of you that were, were around for David's talk earlier, because of the context that, that David was talking about. There, is, uh, there are efforts to reforest areas of Scotland. Um, there, there's a drive to try and plant a lot more forestry. And if we're going to do that, it will be really useful to know how that forestry impacts on species of conservation concern and how we can design and manage that forestry to um, improve habitat for those species. And, and that's some of the motivation um, for putting together this research. So what we had was um, some fantastic data, really. Hen Harrier presence records from 2005 to 2014, um, from surveys of, of breeding harriers. Um, we used Landsat to classify habitat maps for the island, which were then compared against uh, a frankly amazing um, national vegetation classification for the whole island um, and land cover maps. Um, and some national forestry inventory maps, including some very detailed maps of, of certain forest fragments, which allowed us to really to sort of check um, how those land cover maps were looking. Um, and we also had test data, because we kept, uh, kept aside the data from 2015 and 16, so that we had some independent to test predictions on. The difficulty lies in the way people go out and monitor hen harriers. And actually, um, interestingly from, from David's talk on, on black grouse, it's sort of a similar problem that I've experienced in the past for black grouse. The way people go out and monitor these species is they go and search habitat which is likely to be suitable until they find the presence of these species. And then the thing that's recorded is the presence. I know from my own experience that in uh, the black grouse data set, there were absences in the data that I saw because I, I worked on that for my PhD. But those absences were people who were going away from the protocol of the survey. Um, 
they were never asked to record zero because they never should have been looking in that location. They had to be going somewhere where they knew there were species before. Uh, and that would be the same for this. So we end up with a data set that's presence only, almost by design. This causes problems for, for looking at um, things like um, habitat preference and species distributions because um, it then becomes very difficult to deal with the absences that we do have. Um, because we have no idea of detection, we don't know whether they're actual zeros or, or just um, a failure to detect the species that was there. This leads to some interesting methods for dealing with these, um, these problems. Um, and I find that the, the um, recent sort of dis discovery or the, the recent um, development showing that um, models like Maxent, which has been used extensively for looking at presence-only data sets in the past, are equivalent to a point process model, incredibly useful. Because with a point process model, this gives us a framework to actually predict something meaningful, to predict incidence per given unit area. Not a relative score, but, but actually something that means something on the ground. And it also gives us some clear assumptions uh, about things like the distribution of residuals that we can actually test and check. Um, the model I used was, was um, fitted with uh, a lasso penalty using the PPM lasso package in R. Um, and just to, to show why this is useful, the initial model that was fitted, which is directly equivalent, is the same as the Maxent model that would be fitted for these data, um, violates the assumptions that the model um, rests on. We have um, spatial patterns in the residuals and significant clustering um, according to this Ripley's K function. Whereas what we can then do with the point process model is improve this by taking into account uh, spatial dependencies within the data. That there's elements of spatial clustering within the data um, which, using an area interaction model, we can deal with to get a much better fit in terms of residuals and improve um, the, the Ripley's k-plot on the right-hand side there. The results of this mean that we get, get a model which is, we have more confidence in because statistically we've been able to deal with some of these hidden um, issues with the data. And actually in terms of the ecology, um, it's interesting because what it shows, this model, is that hen harrier on mole have an association with, with um, habitat that was de defined as scrub moorland, uh, as combinations of heather with areas of sort of small low scrub, just like we'd expect. That is the, the most influential habitat in a lot of ways. But also, they have positive relationships with intermediate proportions of forestry, um, which includes, in this case, closed canopy forestry. Um, based on the forest inventory, these are areas where the forest is mature, as well as areas where the forest is young. And we have a negative relationship with grazed land, altitude, and increased slope, all of which you might expect from hen harrier ecology. The great thing about the, the model with the Lassie penalty is that it can consider other interactions, it can consider other uh, predictors, but will reduce their influence on the model to zero when they're not actually um, providing much to improve that model. So we end up with something which predicts spatially hen harrier incidence per unit area on the Isle of Mull. And it predicts areas that we, we know anecdotally are, are good for hen harriers. When we test the model, we get um, a predictive power from an AUC score of 0.82 which ideally we'd be looking for some uh, above, say, 0.9. So this is good, but not great. Um, I think partly that is because um, the habitat data that we actually ended up using to construct this model as a, as a proof of concept could be better. Um, it could be more refined. And that's something that I'd like to go on to do. But the conclusions that we can make so far um, are that hen harrier and mole prefer open areas, just like hen harrier do anywhere. Um, but the habitat that they inhabit can consist of, of a mosaic of different things, including scrub, including forestry, including some uh, grazed land, uh, by all means. But heavily grazed land is certainly not beneficial. Um, if you, Jez actually did find that the, the grazed areas were beneficial for his pied flycatchers, I've got some sheep he can have. Um, I just need to convince some Scottish landowners. So um, the other thing that was really interesting is the altitudinal limit in these data um, show that hen harriers don't exist at as higher altitude on mull as they do in mainland Scotland. Now this could be some sort of island effect, um, but, it, but it's interesting for other reasons because what we do have on mull um, in, in greater density than the rest of Scotland are golden eagle territories. Um, and there is some idea that, that part of the thing that's pushing hen harrier down uh, to lower altitudes on mull is that they don't really want to hang around where golden eagles are hanging around 
um, because they're much smaller um, and wouldn't win in a fight, basically. The implications of this, I think, are really useful um, because they say that with a push to increase uh, forestry across Scotland, we could manage mosaic habitats for hen harriet. Um, we could manage the way we put forestry into the landscape, if we knew more about this, to uh, not take away this open land that hen harrier need, but actually fit within their requirements. Um, a grazing reduction might be a beneficial um, side of this, which, along with sympathetic forest management, I think, um, based on my experience of working on, on hen harrier, but also other species, including black grouse, that that it, it would benefit other species as well. A lot of the things that we're seeing here um, wouldn't be terrible for a black grouse population elsewhere in Scotland. But in order to make really uh, useful management recommendations, we need to understand this in more detail. And that's really the next step for this research, is to use more precise um, habitat data to try and be able to say to forest managers, this is the way that we think you should try to, to create um, forests so that hen harriers will use them and, and will find that habitat useful. So thank you very much for your time today. Um, I thank again my collaborators and also um, Sam Riley who provided the terrific hen harrier photos um, from just across the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark Avery, in his book Inglorious, estimated that there should be 2,400 pairs in Britain. Yeah. How does your research influence any estimate of how many we should have? Um, I mean, it, it can't. So I was just wondering, it, since wild dogs are quite sensitive to interspecific competition with our species, yeah. and they, at least in some areas, are more conflict prone, do you the think? Wild dogs. Then wild dogs, yeah. Do you think it could be a, an effect of apparent competition through conflict with local farmers that the wild dogs are doing so well? Um, uh, as in, do you mean like the lion population is being suppressed by local farmers and then that's why the wild dogs... Something like that, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say so because they tend to be found in similar areas. The, the lions tend to like the... Um, the kind of the ranching areas as well. So, um, so yeah, I don't think so. Th there's quite been quite a lot of work done in the area um, on human carnival coexistence, particularly for lions. There's quite a lot of people working on lions in the area, doing lots of work on like mobile bomers to try and prevent any or reduce conflicts um, between people and uh, lions. So, uh, yeah, I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. Um, just following on from the conflict thing a bit, uh, I just wondered if wild dogs do have the same issues as lions in terms of threatening farmers' cattle and livestock and things. Do they do the same sort of... Is there still that issue with wild dogs? Yeah, so um, not with cattle, um, but they, they do sometimes take sheep and goats. Um, but we've, uh, work that's been done in the past in the area has shown that wild dogs will preferentially go for wild prey. So as long as um, there is... So in, in this particular study area, the dog's main diet is dick dicks, which are very small antelopes. So as long as there's a decent supply of their natural prey, they will preferentially go for that. But there are certain areas where there have been issues with conflict, where pe they've been taking people's... Um, shoats and yeah there has been some retaliatory yeah yeah so they can do um, with wild dogs because they tend to just pass through areas um, it's they they've usually managed to leave before <laughs> anything too terrible happens but when there's um, denning when they're denning they're stuck in an area for three months at a time and um, then there can be problems and there have been packs that have been killed by local communities um, in retaliation for taking shoats. Okay, so we've got one last very good question. Thanks for your talk, it was very interesting. I was just wondering what the difference is between a ranching management regime and a pastoralist management regime? Yeah, so the pastoralist areas, um, they are uh, 
sort of community lands that tends to be um, so the commercial ranches um, tend to be one sort of relatively rich landowner who has a bunch of cattle. They tend to have lower cattle densities, um, whereas the pastoralist grazing areas are community lands where lots of people, lots of cows, lots of sheep, basically, much more intensively grazed. Okay, brilliant. So thank you, Helen. Good morning everyone, my name is Johnny Hansen, I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge and I'm a political ecologist. Political ecology looks at how political economy or the politics of economics influences and interacts with the natural world. And what I've been delighted to hear is this is very much a political ecology conference because right from the first two presentations on Monday morning we heard allusions to Brexit and allusions to Trump and that's because ecology, conservation are social processes, they don't happen in a vacuum and social processes, because they involve people are also inherently political processes. The second thing from that relevant to my talk today is that with a lot of the political landslides recently what has been interesting and what was mentioned in those presentations on Monday morning is that facts have seemed to matter less than stories and how those facts are presented, the spin that is put on them and the person who's been able to tell the story that best connects with voters, whether you like those stories or not, has been the person who has won the argument. So with that in mind, I want to tell you, yes, a scientific, give it a scientific presentation, but I also want to tell you a story, and it's a story of snow leopards and sustainability. It's a story of livelihoods, governance, and coexistence in the Himalayas of Nepal. And like all good stories, it starts with the context, the who, the when, the what, the where, and the why. That's what I'll tell you about first. And then I'll go on and look at some of my results and their relevance to the story of snow leopard conservation and I'm sure more broadly the story of conservation, looking at issues of livelihoods and attitudes to snow leopards and their conservation, impact and conflict, as well as a couple of proposed mitigation options. Snow leopards are a wild cat found in the mountains of Central Asia, numbering between about 3,500 to 7,000 across about 1.7 to 2 million square kilometers. That's about six times the size of the British Isles across 12 Central Asian nations. And what is implicit in the literature is that the best way to conserve snow leopards, or one of the best ways, is to diversify the livelihoods of local communities who coexist with them, and also to use decentralized conservation management regimes, i.e. involving people in the management of conservation issues, including snow leopards. However, that hasn't really been tested to date, so I was interested in looking at whether livelihood diversification improved attitudes and reduced conflict, and whether involving people in conservation governance and conservation management did the same, not just for the species, but also for the actors and the interventions used to conserve the species. Because you remember, so conservation is a social process. It's done by people, and it, it's inherently political. In terms of the methods, I, after scoping and piloting, I spent, well, I, we had 12 weeks of field work and I used, collected 705 household questionnaires, mostly analyzed quantitatively with regression models to look at what best predicted attitudes and conflict. But then I used cross methods triangulation with qualitative interviews on the side and that's because that, that makes methods approaches because it is with numbers and words that we make sense of the world, so it is with numbers and words that we also need to make sense of conservation. And the interplay between those is something I'll pick up on as we go through. I was ably helped by uh, Nepali research assistants. I tried and failed horribly to learn Nepali. I also had a, a friend who managed those research assistants when I wasn't in the field and he took all of the wonderful pictures and these are the highest protected areas in the world. I'll tell you the specifics of them in a minute and so experiences range from on the left being lost in a blizzard at four and a half thousand meters with gale force winds at minus 20 to the next day celebrating still being alive in much sunnier regimes even though that in terms of distance these were very close together. Uh, as I've mentioned, I've been working in Nepal, two study sites. Okay, the big green one in the middle 
and then the smaller green one to the right of the orange one in the east of the country. And the first of these is Sagomatha National Park. You might know it by its big mountain, the tallest in the world, Mount Everest. And what's interesting about this one is it was set up very much as a cent centralized management model as an army battalion stationed in the park. Since 2001, as we heard on Monday from one of the other presenters, Nepal has moved slightly more towards a decentralized regime. So even here, there's been a, a degree of, of decentralization and of involving local communities and of sharing revenues, but still not as much as the second site. So the idea is to use two contrasting models to look at the different results. The Annapurna Conservation Area, so set up from the beginning with local communities with a co-management model between a Nepali NGO providing technical assistance and support to local communities who manage a particular area, uh, conservation, agriculture, tourism, and much more, uh, well, at least in theory, uh, revenue sharing from tourism. So otherwise very similar, a lot of tourism in both areas. Uh, slightly higher densities of snow leopard, densities of sheep and goats, which had an impact as well. We'll see later. So that's the context that's the, of the story. That's the who, what, when, where, and why. What about my findings? How did that change the story? And what relevant implications for the conservation of snow leopards? and for conservation and ecology more generally. As I've alluded to, I wanted to look at how conflict and attitudes vary between two sites with different management models. But I also wanted to look at the, this idea of livelihood diversification. So I constructed an index using the Sustainable Livelihoods Index, very commonly used in development studies, and uh, used that to measure the, uh, the degree to which people's households' livelihoods were diversified. And what predicted more diversification, more resilient, more sustainable livelihoods was, no surprise, access to tourism. You've got tens of thousands of, of often quite wealthy tourists passing through and, and people can access income from that industry, but also larger households. And, and no surprises there, that's very common in the literature. Annapurna had a slightly higher, significantly higher actually, uh, degree of livelihood sustainability. Again, it's very hard to prove causation just because you have correlation, as we often know. Qualitative interviews would suggest that, yes, the NGO is providing a lot of technical assistance in terms of livelihood diversification, and that's probably part, certainly part of why livelihoods are higher. So we've got different governance, we've got livelihoods, and I wanted then to look at how that affected attitudes and how that affected conflict. So what about attitudes to the species? Well, what predicted positivity to snow leopards was, as far as I know, the first time it's been included in, in regression models, even though to me it, it seems common sense, is that positivity to snow leopards was best predicted by positivity to snow leopard conservation. And then, rather than more diversification, it was people with less, less livestock who were also positive to snow leopards. But no significant difference, a bit surprising, given that, in theory, if people are more involved in the management of snow leopards, they're going to be more positive. What about attitudes to snow leopard conservation? When I started out, no one had looked at attitudes to snow leopards. There's been a couple of papers published so far. As far as I know, touch wood, no one has looked at this yet. So what about attitudes to snow leopard conservation? Well, what you can see is this very close link again between attitudes to the species and attitudes to conservation. Remember, so conservation is a social process. It's political. It says, we want to do this to and with nature. And other people say, well, no, we want to do this to and with nature. So it's going to have an impact. Uh, and pro people who support it and people who don't. So the lesson is how, uh, the, how a species is perceived and pursued, how, how, how its conservation is done, can affect how the species itself is perceived. But again, no significant difference between the two protected areas, which was surprising again because if you involve people in conservation, the theory is that they become more supportive. From the qualitative interviews, you can see there was a bit. There seems to have been a bit of a breakdown in trust between the NGO and the local communities in the Annapurna area, which may explain why they weren't weren't higher. So, what about actual cases of impact measured by self-reported livestock losses to snow leopards from households? And what best predicted that was more livestock loss to all sources of mortality. And I took that as a proxy for husbandry, and that's common with, with carnivore human conflict. Bad husbandry often predicts losses to livestock. 
more often in Annapurna because it's not really a governance issue, it, it's a, more of a, a biological issue. There are more snow leopards in Annapurna at higher densities and there are also more sheep and goats which snow leopards often predate upon. But what about self-reported conflict with snow leopard conservation? And again, it was the same as with conflicts with snow leopards. You're getting a lot of similarities here with attitudes and conflict between how people relate to the species and how people relate to its conservation. It was more livestock loss, i.e. husbandry, that best predicted actual cases or self-reported cases of conflict with snow leopard conservation. And more of them in Annapurna, again, probably because there's more livestock losses, so there are more cases of conflict. I looked at two examples of proposed mitigation methods that had been proposed to deal with some of this, one in each of the two study sites. In Everest, what had been proposed was the translocation of a population of blue sheep to the area. If snow leopards are eating blue sheep, they're going to eat less livestock. That's the idea. The ecological feasibility study had been done. No one had done the social feasibility study. So we looked at what made people support that idea. And men were more supportive, uh, which is common in the reintroduction literature. But people with less livestock were more supportive. So even though this is being done to help livestock owners, livestock owners were worried from interview data that blue sheep were going to eat their crops and that blue sheep were also going to compete with the livestock for forage. In Annapurna, what had been proposed was a, a reform to the existing conservation scheme where there's a, there's a compensation scheme. Uh, so, sort of uh, reform to that with uh, more of an incentive scheme involving uh, ecotourism, possibly some eco-certification. People who were positive to snow leopards were positive to that, which is similar to the findings with attitudes to conservation. But people with less sustainable livelihoods were more supportive, which is the opposite with attitudes to snow leopard conservation. And that's because in this area, some people are doing rather well out of tourism. This scheme would involve a wider sharing of the benefits, and that's obviously threatening people who are doing rather well. So if you're going to implement this conservation incentive scheme, you need to be thinking about the politics of it. You need to think, is it feasible is, if it's going to annoy the people who control the tourism industry? You're going to have to work with them. So that, in a sense, is what political ecology is all about. So we've looked at the context, we've looked at some of the results and their relevance, but as in any good story, uh, it, and in this story in particular, what it boils down to me, for me is, and the take home message for you, I hope, is that we need to become better in conservation at having conservation conversations. And by that I mean involving not just ecological data, but social, political, philosophical, even theological issues that may make a difference and matter to people's lives. We need to become better at integrating that. We need to become better at telling stories. And lastly, did the main protagonist show up? Well, we saw snow leopard prey, are dead and alive. We saw snow leopard scat. We saw their mythological cousins, the snow lion of Tibetan mythology. And in the end, we had to make our own snow leopard. <laughs> and thank you to all who have been involved in that. I've heard, I've heard about com compensation schemes across the range, not just in Nepal. Do they work? Uh, the evidence is, is sort of mixed. Certainly local people, even when there are problems, are very keen on them because if it affects your livelihoods, you, like to, you want to see recompense for that. But uh, whenever it starts to involve money, people go a bit funny when it, all over the world when it starts to involve money. What I find is that of the incidences of conflict with snow leopard conservation, about two-thirds were over livelihoods. Uh, and, and also two-thirds were over the compensation scheme. So if you are going to do it, you, I think you have to do it very carefully, and it needs to be tied to specific conservation outcomes, because otherwise you have perverse incentives where uh, if you don't look after your livestock and they're eaten by snow leopards because of poor husbandry, you can still get compensation, which is, you know, that needs to be factored in when you design it, so. Okay. Um, so it's time to move on to the next speaker. Um, do we have our next speaker? <laughs> okay. okay, so our next speaker is Frederick um, Dalaran, who's going to talk to us about market prices and large African mammals. Thank you. You just mentioned that 
things get a bit funny when you talk about money, so I'm going to throw myself into the deep end here. I'm not an economist, I'm an old-fashioned community ecologist, but I have a keen interest in, in economical relationships to conservation processes. I'm going to take us all the way back to Walden uh, and the sort of romantic <coughs> movement that occurred but, but primarily in the US in the late 1800s. That's really the birth of modern conservation biology. Uh, and then in the late uh, 1960s or mid-1960s, where do you get this point? The one at the top here. Coming back. <laughs> There's a couple of books that sort of highlight that we are doing things to our environment that is not particularly good. We are depleting it, we are detrimenting it. Uh, and that was really the birth of conservation biology as we, we know it today. And Georgina Mace a couple of years ago made, I think, a quite insightful run-through of the development of conservation biology as it has sort of evolved as its own discipline, where it started being real and native for itself. And we sort of left it at its own accord. And then we had to help it because we were in conflict with it. There was nature against it. And then came the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment with ecosystem services and that whole concept that the nature was actually serving us to some extent. And out of that has now developed a new way of looking at this, which is really an integrated system. We're talking about socio-ecological systems, uh, this blue-green infrastructure, this almost global-scale grant schemes going out now to look at how we integrated in integrating econo or ecological values into economic markets, into policy development and into politics. And uh, <clears throat> out of this have developed the conservation industry. Uh, a beautiful idea of trying to merge in conservation values, conservation actions with making money out of them. Which is a pretty idea, because we need to make money to sustain ourselves as human beings in modern societies. It sort of makes intuitive sense. But for this to work, the market forces, or the, the forces that drive the economic market, needs to be aligned with conservation values or conservation requirements. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to present some data where we are looking at these types of relationships. In a very peculiar market, the South African game industry. This is an interesting market because wildlife species are privately owned. Each wild animal has an economic price, and an economic value, which makes it an, a quite interesting example to look at these types of relationships, because it actually enables us to put a price tag on a biological organism that we can then measure its biological characteristics from. The South African game industry, sorry, button mainly generates external revenues from game viewing, trophy hunting, and various types of meat production. There's a sort of main external ways of making money out of wildlife you own. There's also quite a big breeding industry that is supplying these other kind of activities with game. And uh, to get an idea of how we developed this rather unique situation today, we kind of got, need to go back a bit in history before the 1960s in South Africa, there was really just cattle on, on uh, animal farms. There was really nothing else on them. And then particularly in Zimbabwe in the 1970s, there started to be a, a realization that you could make some money out of keeping game on them as well, primarily through trophy hunting activities. But still, keeping cattle was far more economically profitable, primarily because game at this point couldn't be owned basically treated as something called resinolius, which, if I read up properly on it, is a Latin legal term that basically means that a wild animal is owned by no one until it's gained control over. So you need to have physical control of the animal or you need to have killed it, and then you own it. But before that has happened, it's not owned by anyone. So if you have a wild animal on, on your land, on your private land, it goes to your neighboring land, it's theirs. So it's quite difficult to sort of apply ownership, legal ownership rules to that. That whole thing changed in 1991, when the South African government passed a law that stated that providing that you have an exemption permit that states that you have a legally certified fence around your game farm or your farm property, you actually own the wildlife species within it, even if they go outside of that fence. And that meant that wildlife could start to actually be privately owned. It was economic assets that you could put a price tag on. 
And from then on, we've had a quite rapid um, increase in number of game farms. And this is from a, a rather recent report by Andy Taylor, who estimates that it's about 9,000 game farms of Africa at the moment, which covers a whopping 13% of the total land area in the country. So this is a pretty big scale activity. Uh, there's about 6 million herbivores kept on these game farms, and only the sales of them turn around about 150 million pounds. So this is a pretty big scale activity that uh, is going on. It has had some rather uh, high profile success stories in terms of conservation. These are two of the most well known ones, the southern populations of the white rhinos and the South African population of African wild dogs uh, have benefited greatly from this type of fencing scheme of, of private reserves and private ownership. Particularly the white rhinos pretty much recovered because of wild ownership and sales and movement around private reserves. What also makes this market interesting from an evaluation standpoint is that a lot of these game are sold at auctions. So the prices we get are actually the prices that the buyers are prepared to pay. And uh, these auctions can, prices from these auctions have been compiled. We've got hold of a database of prices from 1991 to 2012, uh, which contains <coughs> prices on, on average, annual auction prices on every species. And I need to hurry up. <laughs> uh, so we're interested basically what, what's, what's influencing these prices. And there's a whole lot of things that does. Uh, end consumer demand, and then a whole rate of market-related processes. Uh, so these things are really the ones that could somehow tell us whether the market is associated with biologically relevant characteristics. These are not at all related to consumer preferences, and these are really related to buyer characteristics. So if you have a lot of money, you may be more likely to pay a high price. So we have three fundamental questions here. One is, are prices related to the evolutionary relevance of individual species? Are they related to the ecological relevance of individual species? And irrespective of these two questions, what biological characteristics are associated with the prices of these species? So we had a whole range of data, and since I'm running out of time, I'm not going to go through it in detail. But we had prices, we had uh, ecological and biological traits, and we had phylogenetic data to look at genetic relationships. To quantify the ecological and evolutionary relevance, we looked at functional diversity and genetic diversity, which somehow is a, a reflection of the, the importance for present ecosystem function and for evolutionary potential. In a cladogram uh, fashion, where we basically set up either a phylogenetic cladogram or a functional one based on functional traits in a trait matrix, and calculated the, the species-specific contribution to the overall variation in here. And interestingly enough, if we look at the, these are the, <coughs> the overall, let me see which one this is. This is the overall contribution to evolutionary potential, and this is the unique contribution to evolutionary potential of each species. Uh, and these are the equivalent functional uh, contributions. And relationship with price. And as you see, there's not particularly strong positive association. In fact, for carnivores, there's a significant negative correlation here. Also, there's been a tremendous Im increase in conservation awareness over time. We saw no improvement in these relationships. That's the time axis, and these are the, the contribution axis. And there's not a great improvement over time in these relationships. So if we look at what actually do determine prices, if we, if we take away any kind of deviant colomorphs and deviant populations, carnivores and ungulates have approximately the same prices. So there's no major taxonomic variance there, which I got surprised by. Uh, and if we look more in detail at specific traits related to prices, two things come out. One thing is deviant colomorphs. Something that is bled into this market are color mutations, black impala beast. Uh, East African population of African buffalo are hugely expensive because they are disease-free. Those things are one of the most influential. Uh, horn length came out for the, herb, the ungulates as well. And these are the only ones. Uh, 
And so this is the carnivores. These are the, the main effects for the ungulates. And this describes the, the interaction terms between each of these terms and time. So it basically tells us if there's a shift in a time trend. And the same thing here for the deviant column morphs and for the horn length, we've had an increased importance of them over time. Uh, just to sort of show what's actually paid for, this is the most expensive animal probably on Earth today. It's an African buffalo that's worth some eight, ten million pounds. Uh, it's a breeding male. <coughs> this is a one of these color mutations of wildebeest. It's a normal wildebeest with the different color patterns. Uh, and this was the highest price for any sort of type of animal we, could f we had in our data set. And it's a normal wildebeest, except it looks a bit odd. These were the two ones with the lowest prices we had, uh, a bush pig, which are lovely animals, but you never see them, uh, and springbok, which are very, very pretty, but very common. So to conclude something out of all this, there seems to be a very poor alignment between pre prices and the evolutionary and ecological relevance of species in this market. Uh, there's been a limited improvement over time in these relationships, and oddity and various aesthetic attributes that doesn't seem to be particularly related to ecology, seems to be determining the prices. And this importance of oddity and aesthetics has increased over time. And since we had so few significant effects of the biological variables we looked at, it suggested other things in biological characteristics are driving the prices. So probably some of these market-related factors that are not related to, uh, to biology of the animals itself. So to conclude, there's just two main points here, that based out of all of this logic, uh, we are sort of questioning whether this game industry is actually contributing or has the potential, at least at the present form, to contribute largely to Southern African biodiversity conservation. And we also think there needs to be some careful scrutiny in looking at how market processes and market values is contrib contributing to conservation in general. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. It was really yeah. interesting. Uh, does not rarity enter the equation? I have may, may missed it. it the we rarity of the lot of work on is the anthropogenic Ali effect. We had IUCN categories in here, and they had no effect. So I've, I've also done some preliminary analysis on uh, we, we're reworking the mammal red list of South Africa at the moment. It's not been published yet. I think it's coming out in January or February next year. But I've put some of those metrics in there, so we're not just working with a, with a global assessment, also with a local one. And there's nothing going on there, which surprised me too. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just interested in the, uh, in the law that, that was brought in that you were talking about. What, and, and whether like the kind of explosion in game farming was a kind of expected or an unexpected consequence of that law? Uh, it was very much an expected one, I think. It, that law was brought in as a way of legalizing ownership of game. And it was brought in, I think, uh, this was before I moved to South Africa, but it was brought in on, of the request of the farmers so that they could actually start to financially profit from the game they were having. And I think they realized there was the... Um, the potential for making profit out of these wildlife species, but there needed to be a legal framework for ownership that was lacking at the time, and that is lacking in the rest of the world. My question is a, a follow-up, actually, to this gentleman's here, just about rarity. Um, was was the idea with IUCN value was that fixed? Was that a one-time rarity assessment? From no, we, we, we because we had a time series of price data, we kept the current IUCN assessment f for that year. For that year. Okay. Yeah, so we updated it with time. 
Thank you very much. It's a fascinating talk. I was just thinking back to the previous talk about conservation conversations. Uh, has there been any sort of sociological research running alongside with the, the people, I was going to say, the, the, the sad middle-aged <laughs> white men who seem to get off on shooting these things? There's a little bit of work, but not too much, sadly. Um, and I think it's interesting because most of these farms which are privately owned, are not owned by the local indigenous people who lives in the areas. Uh, there's a land claim process in South Africa that's about finished, I think, although it's sort of under some political turmoil that is trying to re-put back land ownership into the hands of the people who had it before prior apartheid. Uh, but th there's not been a tremendous amount of work on that. There's what was that lion, Cecil the lion, that got shot here in trophy hunting about a year ago or something like that, that caused a tremendous international uproar. Um, but I have seen no sort of real scientific evaluations of the sort of sociology behind that, but it's not really my field, so maybe you know more about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.